I actually, I'm loath to get into this subject so late in the evening, but in the interests of fairness and honesty, I put this question to the mushroom, how can we save the planet? And without hesitation, it replied, every woman should bear only one natural child. That's not my answer, that's uh, Strafari Cubensis speaking. It would create a demographic collapse that would cut the population of Earth in half without war, disease, or forced migration in less than 40 years. It would also slice the population in half again in the next 40 years. We tend to think that there are no solutions, and yet here's a solution that d requires the responsible action of female individuals, a group that has not yet uh, waded in to the set of historical problems that we have inherited from the past. So if there is a tendency for men to stand in the way of solutions, and I'm not saying they do or they don't, uh, here is a, a program that could be put in place that would have a radical impact on, uh, on human destiny on this planet. I discussed this with demographers after the mushroom made this suggestion, and I learned an, an amazing fact. Some of you may know this. I certainly had never thought of it this way. A woman on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, or in Malibu, or in Scottsdale, in other words, one of these white, upper-class, college-educated, wealthy communities, a woman in that situation, if she has a child, that child will be between 800 and 1,000 times more destructive of the resources of the earth than a child born to a woman in Bangladesh or Pakistan or Zaire. We tend to think of the population problem as a population problem. It's a resource abuse problem and the main resource abusers are the citizens of the high-tech societies. So if you have a house full of kids and you're buying them all $140 pairs of running shoes, uh, you know, you go on the list of major social criminals. Uh, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, so I'm not trying to lay a trip on you, but we tend to not think of uh, our problem that way. We think it's all those beastly little brown people on the other side of the world breeding furiously. Well, I've got news for you. We have met the enemy and it is us. You know, if we could get the honkies to slow down their consumption of resources, we wouldn't uh, have the gun to our head in quite the same way, but I digress. Um, <laughs> Within the last 25 years, there has been a quantum increase in the strength of cannabis. Has there been a corresponding intensification in psilocybin? Is today's insight into the present, future more powerful? Um, probably not, because uh, fungal genetics is notoriously tricky stuff. And as an ex-mushroom grower and the author of Psilocybin Mushroom Grower's Guide, I think what we call strain selection for psilocybin is a pretty rule of thumb kind of thing, while the cannabis botanists among us have worked a miracle on the scale of Luther Burbank's uh, wilder <laughs> endeavors. And we should take our hats off to them. Uh, <clears throat> the same arguments that I made here tonight for psilocybin in a slightly modified form and at a slightly later stage of cultural history, I think cannabis was the major uh, pharmacological habit of human beings retarding uh, patriarchy, male dominance, urbanization, propaganda, so forth and so on. Cannabis is really not given its due 
uh, it's been a tremendous bulwark against the values of dominator culture, and uh, I certainly hope it continues to function that way. Is psilocybin conducive to art activity? Does the Pope live in Rome? <laughs> How do you recommend we use this information in an applied way in our personal lives? Well, and there are other questions which relate to this, like how can you tell if mushrooms have been contaminated by other compounds and so forth and so on. I think that the most enlightened thing uh, a person can do, or one of the most enlightened things, is to cultivate mushrooms. Uh, this completely goes around the possibility of criminal syndicalism, adulteration, uh, uh, degradation through aging, uh, contamination by bacterial parasites, and there are all kinds of problems which are overcome by cultivation. Sometimes people say to me, uh, how do you, what can you do to get ready for a big psilocybin trip if you've never had any psychedelic experience? Well, I think the best advice is grow the mushroom. Those of you who have done that know that it teaches all the virtues that you will need to have when you get out there in the billows. It teaches uh, cleanliness, punctuality, attention to detail, focus, uh, so forth and so on. The things that will serve you invaluably, not only in the psychedelic experience, but in life. And it's a tremendous, you can really feel the force of a possible symbiosis if you cultivate mushrooms because it's so efficient. I mean, you take a $13, 25-pound bag of rye and you can turn it into four or 500 hits. The conversion rate is an astonishing 12% dry weight of rye to dry weight of psilocybin. I mean, it's like an industrial process. It's awesome to see this stuff at work. I mean, it is such a workhorse for humanity. Uh, I used to say that it was alchemy, and the formula was... Uh, uh, Rye to mold and mold to gold. <laughs> so it's a very short step and uh, it teaches you all these values that you may have uh, overlooked in your own uh, toilet training. <laughs> what do you say when your four-year-old asks if you do drugs? Well, what you say is uh, that you do some drugs and then explain which ones. I mean, I have two children. I've been through this. I think it's really weird, people who say, oh, we can't get stoned till the kids go to bed. I mean, what kind of malarkey is this? In the first place, the kids know, so then you're exposed as some kind of half-wit and uh, as totally dishonest, totally not at peace with your own habits. I had habits which shall remain unnamed, which I abandoned because I wasn't comfortable explaining them to my children. So I just dropped those things out of my life. Mushrooms and cannabis were certainly not numbered among them. Uh, so, I mean, you, you have to be honest with your children. Hmm. If psilocybin promotes language and diminishes ego, also a form of language, don't we then have something dis uh, destroying what it creates or creating what it destroys? Is this a contradiction? Well, I'm not sure I buy <clears throat> into the notion that ego is a form of language. However, there is a, I sense the point in this question because it's been suggested that language was created to lie. And is that really what we want to do uh, with each other? But um, I think that that's 
I don't really take that seriously. I think that truth telling and truth withholding are a very delicate uh, matter. You know, Winston Churchill said once, the truth is so precious that she must be accompanied everywhere by a bodyguard of lies. And uh, I, I think that captures some of the paradoxical nature of language. Um, have you read the theoretical work by Julian Jaynes, The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind? What do you think of it? For those of you who haven't read it, this is a theory that until very recently, th what we call the ego was actually a f psychic function that had not yet been integrated in the Jungian sense into consciousness. So that as recently as 3,000 years ago, if somebody got into a tight spot, suddenly a voice would switch on in their head and say the equivalent of, you know, get your ass out of there. And people interpreted this as the voice of God or a God. It was a higher function in the psyche that was only triggered by extreme stress. Well, then we actually assimilated this um, uh, psychic function that had been evolved to respond to extreme danger and we as it were layered it in to the lower levels of the personality and so what had been God became ego and this has happened in Jane's opinion uh, around a thousand BC just at the time when the last mother religions, the last goddess religions were dying out and uh, on the Greek mainland, uh, Mycenaean piracy was taking over from Minoan partnership and mother goddess worship. So uh, yes, I mean, this may definitely uh, be part of it. What makes Jane's book so frustrating is here is a book, I think it has over 630 pages in it. It's a book on the cultural impact of hallucinations and there is one reference to psychedelic drugs. It's a reference to mescaline in a footnote. So Jane's either through lack of information or intellectual queasiness didn't make use of the massive body of information associated with hallucinogenic shamanism that he might have made use of to make his case. It, it's incredible how, how pharmaphobic academic speculation has been. I mean, people just don't want to get near it. And yet, obviously, drugs of all sorts have, have shaped every aspect of our lives. Uh, I'm doing a book for Bantam that will be out next spring sometime, and one of the things uh, about the cultural impact of drugs, psychedelic and non-psychedelic, and one of the things I learned that I just it n had never occurred to me was slavery died with the fall of the Roman Empire. It absolutely died. I mean, during the medieval period, if you owned slaves... You owned one slave. It was like owning a Duesenberg or something. It was the absolute proof that you were a person of immense wealth. And then this slave would serve your food or something like that. But the use of slave labor in agriculture was something that was brought back in the 14th century uh, by Christian, the Christian gentlemen of Europe specifically for the production of sugar. No other reason. The stuff which came later, the tobacco and the cotton and all that, that was simply because there was an oversupply of slaves. And so there was a need to soak up all this slave labor. Why sugar? Because it was an addicting drug. It, nobody needs white sugar. You can go from birth to the grave and never get near it and never miss it. But it was, uh, it, 
sugar is made in open vats in the primitive, you know, the way it was done 500 years ago, at a temperature of about 135 degrees. No free person will work sugar. You have to chain people to the machinery. You literally have to chain them to the machinery and then they die in short order from, uh, from heat prostration. In 1800, every ounce of sugar entering England was produced by slave labor and Western civilization barely had a thing to say about it. And we don't even think of sugar as a drug unless we're very highly sensitized to these issues. But, you know, if you have small children, you know, you just might as well lay out railers of blow <laughs> if you're going to turn them loose with cho those Pepperidge Farm chocolate chip cookies. I mean, my God. So I, I just offer that as an example of our naivete about drugs and our naivete about our own cultural history. I mean, people say, well, slavery, they got rid of it with Lincoln, but it had been going on for thousands of years. Uh-uh. No, no, not at all. It, it had been dead for a thousand years, and then it was brought back by the drug trade. And how many steps backward in the process of trying to define and honor the human spirit have occurred because of drugs like sugar, opium, tea, coffee. Look at the caffeine drugs. They're the only drugs on earth that modern industrialists recognize to the point that they write them into contracts with workers. The coffee break. This isn't because they love workers. It's because it makes workers work. And caffeine and the demands of uh, linear industrialism m made a marriage in hell which exists right up to this day with untold consequences in the form of stomach cancer, anxiety, aggressive behavior, you name it. Well, we're over the time. We have piles of questions. I love you all. Stay happy. Take it easy. But take it.